Hey everyone, this lesson is on rotavirus infections. So we're gonna talk about some of the risk factors for getting rotavirus infections. We're also gonna talk about some of the pathophysiology behind the infection. We're also gonna talk about some of the signs and symptoms, how we diagnose it and how we treat it. So rotavirus is actually the most common cause of severe gastroenteritis in young children. So gastroenteritis, if you were to break that word down, itis is inflammation. So inflammation of gastro is stomach and enter really means the intestines. So it's inflammation of the stomach and intestines. So it's a inflammatory condition of your gastrointestinal system. So it's actually the most common cause of severe gastroenteritis in young children. And when I say young children, I really mean younger than five years old. And it's actually a significant cause of infant mortality in developing nations. So the rotavirus is actually a double-stranded RNA virus and it is transmitted via the fecal oral route. Like many different infectious diseases, it goes through this route. So you can see this on contaminated surfaces like dirty hands and other dirty surfaces. So if someone has a contaminated hand and they touch a table, they can contaminate the table as well. And that could be a way of actually transmitting this infection. It can actually be in food and water, although this is rare. So if the water itself is contaminated and it gets into certain foods that aren't washed properly, it could lead to a rotavirus infection. And rotavirus itself may exhibit seasonality. So like some other viruses, there's some seasonality to the rotavirus infection. So parts of the world closer to the poles that have colder winters, winter is often the season where we see more rotavirus infections. So what are some of the risk factors for getting infected with rotavirus? So the first one is being a young child and more specifically a young child who is not immunized. So a young unimmunized child is at risk for getting rotavirus. A second one is caretakers. So anybody that is taking care of young children or elderly population are more at risk as well. And the third risk factor is immunocompromise. So if you're immune system is compromised or suppressed for any reason, it's going to increase your risk for having a variety of infections. And one of them is rotavirus infections. So what is the pathophysiology of a rotavirus infection? First, rotavirus is a highly contagious virus. You only need to be exposed to a very small amount of viral particles in order to become infected. And the incubation period, the period of time from when you become infected to when you have an onset of symptoms is roughly 24 to 72 hours, and usually it's 48 hours or less. There's actually 10 different species of rotavirus entitled species A to J, with species A being the most common cause of infections in children. So what does rotavirus do specifically to cause illness, or what does it do specifically to cause its symptoms? So for one, it actually decreases brush border enzymes. So it decreases enzymes in the brush border. And these enzymes are important in metabolizing and degrading nutrients. So some of the enzymes that are actually decreased in a rotavirus infection are sucrase, maltase, and lactase. So these enzymes are decreased. And these three enzymes actually help degrade and metabolize sugars. So sucrase helps to metabolize sucrose. Maltase helps to break down or metabolize maltose and lactase helps to break down lactose. So if these enzymes can't break down these sugars properly, these sugars aren't absorbed and they build up in the gastrointestinal lumen. So we have an increase in sucrose, maltose and lactose in the gastrointestinal lumen. And because there's these sugars there, it draws water from the gastrointestinal mucosa into the gastrointestinal lumen, leading to osmotic diarrhea. So this is the reason why we get this watery diarrhea with rotavirus infections. Another thing that rotavirus does is it actually has an enterotoxin known as NSP4. And NSP4 is an enterotoxin that has direct toxic effects on gastrointestinal mucosa or on the enterocytes. So it has this direct toxic effect on the cells in your gastrointestinal system. So that is another mechanism by which rotavirus causes gastrointestinal symptoms. And rotavirus infections also lead to an overactivation of the enteric nervous system. So enteric nervous system is the nervous system in your gastrointestinal system. So when it actually causes an overactivation of the enteric nervous system, this leads to pumping out of fluid and electrolytes from the gastrointestinal mucosa into the gastrointestinal lumen. And this also causes a watery diarrhea it causes a lot of fluid loss. So multiple mechanisms lead to this watery or osmotic diarrhea.
So what are some of these signs and symptoms of rotavirus infections? Now that we know the pathophysiology of a rotavirus infection, knowing the symptoms will become easier. So the first one is diarrhea. As we mentioned before, those mechanisms we talked about lead to a diarrhea, and it's a watery diarrhea, and it's not a bloody diarrhea. We can also see nausea and vomiting being a symptom in rotavirus infections as well. I didn't mention this before, but rotavirus infections can disrupt serotonergic pathways in the gastrointestinal system, leading to nausea and vomiting. And we also find that rotavirus infections lead to a fever. And we can also see fatigue and malaise as well. So diarrhea, nausea and vomiting, and fever are the most common symptoms with a rotavirus infection. And because of all of this watery diarrhea and nausea and vomiting, we can see severe dehydration. So there's a lot of fluid losses. So Signs of severe dehydration, if you look at a patient that is severely dehydrated, we can see dry mucous membrane. So if you look at their tongue, it'll look like this. Dry axilla, so their armpits are very dry, they're not sweating. And decreased skin turgor. And although I mentioned that rotavirus infections oftentimes affect children, it can affect adults. But what we do find is that symptoms in adults are similar to those in children, but much less severe. So the worst presentations are in children, and oftentimes we can also see a very severe presentation in immunocompromised individuals. So again, symptoms in adults, very similar. They have these symptoms, but at a lower severity. And children in the immunocompromised have the most severe presentations. They have the worst cases of a rotavirus infection. We can also find some other clinical findings with regards to a rotavirus infection as well. So we may see that in children, some children may exhibit respiratory symptoms. So it's not clear whether rotavirus itself is causing respiratory symptoms or if there's an associated pathogen that is causing the respiratory symptoms. But we also do see that patients, particularly children, may develop neurological symptoms when they are infected with rotavirus. So it affects approximately 2 to 3% of children. And the symptoms that these 2 to 3% of children get are encephalitis and seizures. So altered mental status, fever, and seizure, so convulsions. So again, this affects two to 3% of children who are infected with a rotavirus infection. There are specific laboratory findings as well with regards to rotavirus infection. These include increased BUN, so blood, urea, and nitrogen. This basically indicates that the patient is dehydrated. And we can also see metabolic acidosis as well. But when we actually look at the white blood cell count, the leukocyte count, it is normal. So it's not a case of leukocytosis where there would be a high level of white blood cells. It's actually a normal white blood cell count, even though they're having all these symptoms and they have a fever and are unwell. And if we check their stool, we can find a mild to moderate amount of fecal leukocytes. Now, this doesn't occur in all patients, but we can see this in some patients. And with regards to all of these symptoms we talked about in the last couple of slides, symptoms generally last between two to eight days, but it can vary between individuals. And when a patient is infected with rotavirus, they often shed the rotavirus from their gastrointestinal system. And it's been found that infected individuals can shed the virus for upwards of 10 days. And in some cases, it's been noted to be even longer. So even if the patient has recovered, they can still be shedding the virus and can still infect others for a certain period of time. How is rotavirus infections diagnosed and how are they treated? So the diagnosis of a rotavirus infection is oftentimes by looking at the stool of an individual who you suspect has a rotavirus infection. So it's stool detection of the rotavirus itself. So you can do this with ELISA or PCR. So ELISA is enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay and PCR is polymerase chain reaction. And this helps detect the virus. So that makes the diagnosis. So how is it treated? So treatment of rotavirus is often supportive because the rotavirus infection is a self-limited infection. It will oftentimes resolve on its own. So again, treatment is supportive. What do I mean by supportive? I mean that a lot of times maintaining hydration is the goal with treating patients. So because patients can become severely dehydrated, maintaining hydration is important. If there is severe vomiting, ondansetron can be used to help reduce symptoms of nausea. And oftentimes, a clinician will promote resuming an age-appropriate diet as soon as tolerable. So once a patient is able to eat or drink, they are started on their age-appropriate diet. And the last point I want to mention here is prevention. So prevention is 
very important. So it's better to prevent than it is to deal with it later once you actually have been infected with it. So rotavirus vaccination can help reduce the risk of getting rotavirus infection and also help reduce the morbidity with regards to rotavirus infections. So if you want to learn more about other infectious diseases, please check out my infectious disease playlist. And if you haven't already, please consider liking, subscribing, and clicking the notification bell to help support the channel and stay up to date on future lessons. Thank you so much for watching and I hope to see you next time.